Welcome to today's panel, Hair and Health, the link between self-image and wellness with Dr. Manishi Jolly and Kalia Patrice, two experts featured in the Hair to Hair documentary, which is available to watch through the Chicago Public Library, courtesy of Amelia Street Studio. The film is directed by Andrea Alberti and produced by Katie Osborne. If you haven't seen Head to Head, you can register to watch it at chicagopubliclibrary.org backslash head to head. The link will expire on February the 9th and we will post the link in the chat. We also want to welcome today's moderator, Dr. Shirley Burton. Dr. Burton has married her training as a licensed clinical mental health professional and a certified coach, speaker, and trainer with over 40 years of experience in the area of personal growth and development to serve individuals at various levels of their development. These services are offered to individuals and organizations in the private and public sectors through Shirley Burton Consulting, of which she is the founder and the CEO. She is an executive director on the John Maxwell team and global team of coaches, which has international reach, offering professional, personal, and group coaching. Her mission, to inspire and empower others to be their best selves. She is passionate about personal development and seeks all opportunities to enhance her own growth while helping others to discover their voice, their purpose, to debunk self-limiting beliefs, to attain personal and professional goals, and live their dreams. For her, there is no finish line in personal growth. Her services are delivered in English and Spanish. Next, we have Kalia Patrice, who understands that relationships and image are interlocking keys to transformational growth and healthy business. She is the founder of the Image Studios, a personal brand and image communication firm launched in 2000 out of a commitment to helping others understand, define, and share their stories. By pairing her Carnegie Mellon chemical engineering degree with industry expertise in R&D, marketing, and sales, Kalia has built a successful business that teaches individuals and organizations how to be seen, heard, understood, and impact change. Kalia's work has been featured by ABC, Fox, WGN, Chicago Sun-Times, The Tribune, The Red Book, Where, and Crane Chicago Business. Her passions include doubling as a hair whisperer, mentoring and supporting community programs for urban youth and women in STEM. Most recently, Kalia produced the award-winning documentary, Sick Cancers, Exploring Social and Biological Cancers. She now commits her time and talents to the world of health and wellness, while splitting time between Los Angeles and Chicago. Finally, Dr. Manishi Jolly is a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and Psychiatric Behavior Science at Rush Medical College. She is Associate Program Director of the Rush Rheumatology Fellowship Program, Program Director of the Master in Clinical Research Program in the Rush Graduate College and Director of the Rush Lupus Clinic. Dr. Jolie currently serves on the Medical Advisory Board of the Lupus Society of Illinois. She is the Associate Editor for American College of Rheumatology Open Journal and on the Editorial Board of the Arthritis Care and Research Journal of Clinical Rheumatology and Lupus Journal. Dr. Jolly's clinical, educational, and research focus is in lupus and health outcomes using a biopsychosocial model for health, which she will talk more about today. Welcome our panelists and all of our attendees. Hey, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have a very, very interesting uh, panel for you today. And, um, we hope that uh, at the end of this, you know more about lupus. You understand the journey about women who have lupus and uh, how it impacts their hair. We all have uh, hair stories, but today we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Jolly and Kelly Patrice about a specific study that they did uh, focusing on women with lupus and the impact on their hair and, other, and their self image in general. So, I'm gonna get right uh, to it. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Jolly. Uh, I'd like, and, and you can begin to prep yourself also, uh, Kelly, because I'd like you to share with us, um, what was your journey? Uh, where did you start 
and uh, to get you to where you are today. So uh, for Dr. Jolly, um, can you tell us a little bit about what made you become interested in uh, studying lupus and then what brought you to Rush? So lupus, so I had to find my way uh, to where I am currently, it is a journey. I realized uh, over a period of time, the things that I really enjoy are taking care of young people, um, children, you know, issues around pregnancy, issues of uh, psychological health of patients, and I like to take care of patients for the long term. And um, during my training, I came across patients with lupus, and it kind of covered all of those areas. My love for children uh, that I was telling you, the background here, real background is all the high-risk pregnancies that I deal with. It allows me to be part of uh, young people's lives for a long time, involve, be involved in their psychological health or psychosocial health, all aspects. Because health is not in isolation. You know, a person lives with people and their conditions or health affects very many other people in their lives, as well as other people in their lives affect their health also both ways. So nobody is in isolation. So I thought that um, providing care and doing research and education in this disease um, really spoke to me where my interests lay. I'm also an artist. Um, and um, so a lot of different kinds of arts. I do creative arts and I was able to somehow incorporate those interests into my profession also. Uh, makeup is something I had never learned myself growing up. That is something I learned actually with Kali. Mm -hmm. um, when she was teaching patients, uh, I, we were reading books and I would go home and try on myself. <laughs> uh, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. So that is how I came to take care of patients with lupus, uh, having myself had some chronic dis uh, health condition being myself admitted as a patient, um, being here without extended family members or support system myself, I realized how important social support and psychological health is um, in feeling good and feeling healthy. And those kinds of things triggered different things and it all came together as a jigsaw puzzle providing care for patients with lupus. Um, so I like to make some difference in patients' uh, lives in whatever way I can. Now, lupus is a disease where we don't have very many good treatments. And most of uh, our colleagues in rheumatology focus on uh, medications and providing care to patients with medications. Nothing against giving medications. That is what is part of our job. But I realized that there are not the you know, the safest medicines, the most effective medicines available to us. We do what we need to do to treat our patients, but there are so many more things we can do to make patients uh, feel better and be more healthy, but we weren't paying attention to any of those. Um, and part of that is because we have very limited time, but part of it is also that um, we're not trained in asking those questions. One person may not be comfortable asking those questions um, because these may pertain to some issues that may be of sensitive nature to the person who's asking and the person who's being asked these questions and it can lead to uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. And second, even if you find out there are issues, we do not necessarily have all the training or even the know-how of what resources we can provide to our patients, what we can do to address that. And so that adds to the discomfort there. But uh, I felt that having the viewpoint as a patient that these are important things that need to be done simultaneously. They're not less important. In fact, they are much more important in empowering these patients. I believe in empowerment of patients and especially women. Um, and lupus, uh, I can tell you more about the condition. It is a condition that affects most often women and that to young women. And uh, that again goes to, uh, speaks to my heart of empowering women. So research in lupus was the next step to do. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I, I certainly agree with you that um, 
we there's no one way to look at anything and the psychosocial approach is definitely the way to go so we'll go to um Khalif. uh can you tell us uh Khalif, what were you doing before image studio and um why did what made you launch image studio so um it, you know i feel like i was born a sickly kid that was the hair whisperer um i had I was a kid that had a lot of different health conditions and was fairly introverted, but I loved hair. I always loved hair. And um, I pursued a degree in chemical engineering because I wanted to make hair care products. And then I took a break from Carnegie Mellon and opened a salon because I wanted to do hair. You know, I was kind of always this, I want to make, I want to do the tech, I want to do the science side, and I want to do the beauty side, science side, beauty side. And I could really struggled to find my home and along the way um, was building, unbeknownst to me, a very significant health journey of, you know, getting myself well. And the, my work, once I finished my degree and had opened a, a salon, I did both concurrently um, through, through undergrad, I wound up working in cosmetics. I worked for hair care companies. I went to formulate hair care and um, skin care products. First for a boutique company called Dudley Products in North Carolina and then for Soft Sheen which ultimately became L'Oreal. And I continued doing that until I decided to start a family and starting a family kind of recognized, you know, it's probably better not to be around all these chemicals while I'm making a person. So I went into food science mm -hmm. and that was, um, that was a big company experience for me. My first Fortune 10 where I got to kind of be exposed to what it meant to be um, for the shareholders to have the power of the work that you did. And, and, and I learned then about systems, right? That was my first exposure, my naivete being stripped away of there are some systems that exist around um, sometimes capitalism runs in tension with kind of what we need to do for people. And then um, I started the image studios. Ironically, you know, I've had the, always had the immense blessing of having my gifts make room for me and every good thing has come to me because of hair. Every good thing. Everything um, now I can see at a time that I didn't see it. So when I um, I wrote the business plan for the image studios for, in Charlotte, North, for Charlotte, North Carolina. And when I finished the plan, Soft Sheen called me and said, we got a problem uh, with, a, with a new line we launched called Mazzani. And can you help us? And I was like, God, I just finished this business plan I consulted with you on. And um, so now I'm supposed to leave. And I made all these rules around why I wasn't, I couldn't, I can't go if you don't do this. I can't go if you don't do that. And I was just kind of just made the stakes so high and everything I said, you know, I thought surely they wouldn't do, they did. And I, I, I just reluctantly left North Carolina and moved to Chicago. And that brought me to Chicago where I ultimately wound up working for Kraft. But I left Kraft because I recognized two things. One is my job was to make food products less and less expensive for the benefit of shareholders without customers knowing the difference. And that was huge because I was good at it because the chemistry of processed cheese and the chemistry of hair relaxers is identical. And except for relaxers is way harder. So I was extraordinarily good at doing something that was horribly bad for people and I knew it, but I was rewarded and my career was nothing but up. So when I resigned, I didn't have a place to go. And I picked up the business plan while I was um, in labor <laughs> with my daughter and, um, and dusted it off and tried it. And the rest kind of, as I say, is history. The plan for the image studios was to be a way to teach and share testimony with people that were just like me, folks that were nerds, that spent their time in their heads and not necessarily focused on telling their stories and, and were getting lost in corporate. Um, but we're super duper smart and that was, and I thought Chicago didn't need it. Surely that company already existed, but lo and behold, it didn't. And, um, and that brought me to the image studios, it, you know, as the founder, but I'm as much a, I'm as much a, a client as I have been the founder for the entire process. <laughs> well, that, that's certainly a journey, um, because, um, you, you had this plan and you dusted it off um, when you got back to, um, to what you wanted to do. And um, it, it worked for you and it's still working for you. Uh, and then you said that hair has always been 
the yeah. thing that brought good things to you. So, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we're on a journey and we might take a detour, but if it's our journey, we'll come back to it. So here you are and doing good things. So thank you very much. So I, I just want to uh, jump into to now, before I do that, can you tell me how did the two of you uh, come together? How did you meet each other? And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a good story to this. But tell us, how did you meet each other and decide that you want to work together? So I also would be interested in hearing Kali's perspective because a story results in a commonality, but uh, everyone's perception and story is different from another side. Okay. I believe that there was a bigger purpose working there mm -hmm. and it happened at Rush. I uh, do research in lupus and uh, just to give you a background that um, lupus is an autoimmune disease, immune system disorder that can affect any and every organ in the body. It affects young women, very much more so uh, women of color. Men are affected, yes, but mainly people 20 to 40 years of age. Mm -hmm. And the disease can affect not only the skin uh, in the form of rashes, hair loss, you know, but it can affect one's appearance and, um, you know, what they look like, uh, weight, and the medications add to that too. So it does affect their self-esteem and uh, things like that. And young people are also in the midst of dating, you know, education, um, making relationships, parenting, this, that. And I really wanted to do something to improve their health outcomes. And I had heard from my patients significant concerns around, you know, when I go to interview, for example, um, for uh, further training for college or this or that, or for a job, I'm sitting there, but before a person, the interviewer looks at and starts talking to me, they see my lupus before they see me, right? So there was another person in the story in the room sitting with them and that person was seen before actually the person being interviewed. So it, I had heard so many stories, 50% divorce rate is what we've been told and similar stories with dating. When is a good time to tell the boyfriend that we have lupus, uh, whether we should hide it from our employers, whether we should even tell. So I wanted to do something and I wanted to do something around uh, body image. As I told you, I'm very interested in psychological parts, impacts it has on their, you know, day-to-day -day rehabilitation. How can you rehabilitate yourself um, if you can't even find a job mm -hmm. uh, or even find people to talk to? So I had been doing some um, foundation laying work on body image in patients with lupus starting from you know showing that people have poor body image in lupus because body image had been studied in patients who have cancer or burns or eating disorders you know but not in regular you and me people conditions right and um, people would think why would this be important especially from a rheumatologist standpoint like why am i talking about this people refer to me as that touchy feely doctor you know, because I was talking about emotions uh, and how people feel. Um, so one of those things I realized was if I can give them some skill sets to empower them to deal with this, you know, unidentified person sitting in the room when they don't want that person to be there, then that would be helpful. Um, you know, it's not to say that they need to hide any rashes or cover their rashes. One should wear anything and everything they have very proudly. But if they need it to, that they have some skill sets on how to do it, mm -hmm. uh, when to do it, and feel more empowered if they need to be in that situation. But we also know our lupus patients, they can't put anything and everything on their skin uh, or their hair uh, because it can damage their skin or, or their scalp. So it needed to be done in a more educated, more scientific manner. So I was looking in our institution, what are some things that are available so I don't have to start from scratch. Um, and I realized that our lupus patients get chemotherapy medicines for the treatment of their lupus. 
what other patients get chemotherapy medicines are cancer patients. And I knew, I knew there are programs for cancer patients where they're taught how to do makeup safe. They have anemia or have had hair loss and things like that. They are given those support uh, and resources and training. So I looked within our institution, reached out to a couple of people to say, hey, listen, you know, you guys I hear have some access to that. What are some of the resources? And sure enough, I was told that at Rush, there was a program called uh, Look Good and Feel Better program. That was for cancer patients where cosmetologists, trained cosmetologists, before that I didn't even know there was a term called cosmetologist, uh, come, they are trained scientifically and uh, give professional advice to cancer patients. And they are not just telling them to put this or that, but these are good products. Um, and it was you know, there was a full program available to them. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to them and I said, can I sit through one of these sessions? I don't have cancer. So I sat through one of Kali's sessions. Mm -hmm. And after that session ended, I just reached out to Kali and I said, hey, listen, I am so-and-so. I'm doing studies and taking care of patients with lupus. And I had a hard to have hard talk with Kali that this is what I want to do, but I want to offer a similar program, but our patients' concerns are different. They are actually much more far advanced than what you're dealing with here. But our patients get chemo also, but they don't have access to these resources. But first I need to, before I make those changes, I have to prove that this works for our patients. So I sat down, she was more than willing to help me out. Um, and that's where our introduction and relationship developed. Um, and from there, then I created some educational materials for Kali to teach her about lupus. We discussed what can be offered to our patients. And then we came up with the program that we developed. Kali, I would like to hear your side of the story too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Kali, tell us, tell us what, what did you offer um, in this program specifically? Um, so, so what's, what's uh, intriguing is that I was hiding out in that program. Um, I, as the founder of the image studios, I couldn't let anybody know, so I thought that I did care. So I would volunteer at Rush in teaching look, look, look and feel better programs every month. And I had done it for almost five years, um, since, you know, every month for five years when I met Dr. Jolly. Um, the, the work that we were doing that wound up being a part of the, the program is supporting women, overwhelmingly the Industrios does, with sharing the truth about themselves through hair, hair styling, hair styling alternatives was what we were doing. We were teaching, I was teaching wig styling, how to cut wigs, um, how to wrap head wraps, how to select head wraps, scarves, um, hair styling alternatives. Um, makeup application, which expanded in particularly for this study in terms of um, more camouflaging makeup applications for patients with scarring. You know, the image studios was doing, we had makeup artists that taught makeup, mostly for corporate. The work that we were doing was overwhelmingly for women that were genius and um, and blocked for one reason or another advancing in their career. Mm -hmm. And they were then you know, taught these skills for sharing their story with hair, with makeup, and with wardrobe. And so the wardrobe application in this in the study that I did with Dr. Jolly had to do with helping patients that experienced weight loss and weight gain and bloating and incontinence, how to dress in a way that allowed for them to be empowered and be themselves and feel completely comfortable mm -hmm. in spite of um, in spite of symptoms related to um, lupus, mm -hmm. yeah. but um, but no, I it's it's funny, Dr. Jolly. I I was um, and and Dr. Jolly, I thought surely when she was asking for help, she meant like a week. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Yes, uh, exactly. So I <laughs> my request to Kali was I understand you know when you see cancer patients and you see them wearing a head wrap. 
it feels like they're cancer patients wearing head wraps, mm -hmm. right? Or, or wearing a wig to cover um, their hair loss from the chemotherapy. I said, my patients, you know, cancer patients are usually older than our lupus patients. I said, these ladies need to not look like a cancer patient walking around with a head wrap. Mm -hmm. I want something that is done tastefully, that is not too expensive. You know, they don't have access to the kind of resources that other people have. They've spent so much money on Walgreens and Targets trying to buy some makeup, but doesn't work because the pigmentation issues and scarring issues are so bad. I want, want good quality products that match their skin tones, that cover, show us how this will be covered, shows good head wraps. I remember Kali, one of the patients asking that she had incontinence because spinal cord had been affected from lupus. And she said, I don't go out at all. What if I had a pee accident and all my clothes were wet? Mm -hmm. And so we were talking to Kali, Kali, how can we give her some self-confidence that she can wear that even if she has a pee accident leak, that doesn't show um, what can we do? And Kali was, you know, was very resourceful in building up a whole program for us, one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one personalized attention to patients that were participating in the study and mm -hmm. coming up with some resolution of those things. Yeah, I, I can see how it does affect the entire person, you know, and it's not just aesthetics, but what they're feeling emotionally and how it, it impinges on their, um, their actions, their ability to go out and feel good about going out or, you know, the freedom that they would like to have. So can you tell us what was the outcome of the study? Uh, or can you tell us a little bit more about the study, specifically what the study entailed and then what was the outcome? What, w what was it that you were looking to find? It, it, did you find it? That's um, a lot of questions, but you got sure. it. Sure. So as I said, we wanted to improve health outcomes, meaning what were the outcomes of their health condition, but mainly focused on their body image. So what we did, we did uh, 15 patients that we were, that uh, were getting this intervention is what we say. Mm -hmm. And 15 people who were being treated just as usual without any active intervention that we were doing to them, just as they would be treated. Um, so what our intervention included was educating them about lupus, educating them about their skin hair care, um, and then cognitive behavioral therapy that we use for body image specifically because we want to also address the inner um, damage that had already happened from people's comments and things like that as they were growing up. Mm -hmm. Plus, we wanted to give them tools to be able to cope with any adverse situations that gave them discomfort, anxiety, or depression when somebody, anybody makes a comment or such. So cognitive behavioral therapy happened. That was two hours once a week. We did that for eight weeks. And then in the end, we did uh, the appearance enhancement skills training, which was catering to each and every, you know, of those 15 patients, included hair, um, you know, whether that was advice on wigs, how to select, what to select, how to wear it, how to avoid pressure in the zones, head wraps, whatever a patient, um, you know, felt comfortable with, mm -hmm. uh, makeup, how to take attention from the areas that were scarred or disfigured and highlight some of the stronger features. Um, Kali, you would feel so proud of me for being able to say all that. Um, <laughs> Contouring, the word I never knew, uh, contouring and something called triangulation, um, you know, uh, those features actually we read, went through books to find which features would work and not. So for example, a patient had rashes or scarring around the lips, we would highlight their eyes so that the direct focus doesn't go on their lips. Um, so those sort of um, things and then wardrobe you know, weight gain, scars to be covered or not covered. So those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So oh, it's a very it, extensive study. Very it extensive. was a very extensive and we matched all good quality uh, makeup, uh, makeup um, products that also we researched because they were 
variety of skin tones um, of, you know, among the group. And for some, there were no cosmetic products that match those particular. And Kali was kind enough to guide us to the right products, the application. They all tried the applications themselves. And what we did was we measured a lot of things before the intervention during the intervention mm -hmm. and then after the intervention and three months after all of this had com been completed. Mm -hmm. What we found was, yes, body image was poor in patients with lupus, but it started to improve, um, you know, during, during the cognitive behavioral therapy, we were finding that it was a little bit dis disruptive to their, um, to their, uh, you know, it was causing a little bit of discomfort discussing all the things. But towards the end of the uh, intervention, people had better body image. And we saw that once the intervention was completed, actually three months later, the depression also improved. Not only did body image continue to stay improved, but having better skill set, whether it was the behavioral therapy as well as the skills that they learned it led to reduced depression, even when the intervention had finished. And so here were the gains that were seen in the people that participated in the study, but yet the 15 people that didn't participate in the study, their things were going down. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were feeling more depressed, had worse body image issues. Um, and during the study, we made sure that nobody was flaring with their lupus or no other changes were happening you know, uh, in terms of medication changes and all that. So I really felt based on the study that these are the reasons why we need to focus on this biopsychosocial model for health means not just biologically what is wrong with you that you have this disease, go pop this pill. Right. But we need to take into account the psychological aspects and the social aspects. When a person is feeling better, they may even be more willing to accept the treatment you're giving. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they're not feeling good about themselves, they may not even accept the pills that they need to take mm -hmm. uh, or, or come up or social, you know, interactions and things like yeah. that. So absolutely, absolutely, uh, Dr. Uh, Jolly, that was a very good explanation and description of what happened. Uh, I'd like to spend a little time, um, actually, if you can, talking about the, um, I know you did the aesthetics, but you also were sensitive to the internal journey that these patients had to go through. Isn't that correct? Yes. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about that, Kali, in terms of the, the need for that internal alignment also with the aesthetics? So, you know, that came largely through training that I had had on the job, um, working with, with women and understanding that the, the, the aesthetic changes that we were making um, would only be sticky and well-received mm -hmm. if they tethered to the right things in terms of how they felt about themselves, what they believed about themselves and what they were trying to share. So <clears throat> I had an appreciation for those needs. What I had to learn was, um, like Dr. Dr. Jolly said, was I had to gain an understanding of what specifically were some of the symptoms that di different patients were gonna be seeing. Mm -hmm. And often when we were in the room, and it was very much a week, so you know, like I sit here and Dr. Jolly's like, a week, a week, a week. But be very clear that the makeup artist that was doing the makeup was a makeup artist from the image studios who also was the makeup artist that did Wicked and was making Tabitha Green for Wicked. I mean, like, so, so I'm, you know, I'm, I was at the helm leading, but there were, um, there were, was real talent that was, um, was, was doing the work. And, and my role overwhelmingly was to make sure that there was that sensitivity, right? That the, that the language was what it needed to be because you the language had to change based on a sensitivity or well what were the circumstances of um, hair loss it's a different thing to help somebody with a wig if they're getting a wig for to look fabulous for an event that they've got coming up versus they're getting a wig because what they are faced with is hair loss over which they have no control mm -hmm. so um, so that that um, experiential training that I had really did come in very handy. It was necessary, 
to be effective working with the with the 15 men, women that we work with. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I, my makeup artist would be talking and I could be like, uh, you know. Right. You know you have to. So I, I guess um, this also touches upon the, um, the whole issue of beauty and what it is that we see as beauty and how the patients, women, these women and, and also every woman, uh, have to contend with uh, what really is beauty, uh, you know, whose standard am I uh, trying to uphold? Uh, can you talk, I know you have a specific perspective on that uh, also, Kali. <laughs> you want to talk about that a little bit because I know that we're getting short on time, but I do want to hear about that. And then I'm going to come back to Dr. Jolly because uh, there is something that I know that you've been crusading about relating to this, and I'd like you to get a chance to talk about that. So, Kelly, yeah. Yes. So, um, I, I'm, ex I'm very passionate about the need for beauty to be de um, uh, demystified, the word itself, to be mystified and to um, be accepted as being more than just superficial, like almost like a more divine um, definition of what beauty is um, and and the reason why is because what we live in now is a an environment that's so or right it's either beauty or it's science it's either um, superficial or it is um, you know medicine right and and the reality is it's we are integration is, is where it all lies and so for me, I, I feel very strongly that it's important for us to be able to marry the attitudes around the importance of beauty and define them as being related to self-image, being related to um, divinity, being related to um, positivity, being related to art, um, and, and, and if we accept beauty as all of those things, then it becomes more relevant in spheres like mental health, like medicine, um, like business, um, storytelling, and there can be more cross, more collaboration and more power in teams and individuals working together. Mm -hmm. I think that this, 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 at this, what's happened to our detriment is there such a hard line of kind of this is the beauty world and in that beauty and that world is makeup and fashion and all things superficial but this over here is um is a space that's something else when the two really do go together and what's interesting which i have to point out is that what, what, what dr jolly and i have in common and i think many people have this but they are not in a society that makes you be or not and you're not at liberty to express it is she's an artist and a physician and a researcher i am the hair whisperer and a chemical engineer and the founder of of a company and 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 when we when we broaden, it's, it's about um, integration, when we have a more integrated approach and a more broad look at it can be both, then it's more useful for all of us because I spent 20 years hiding out as the hair whisperer. I, I literally, online, you don't find Khalid. I'm the hair whisperer online because I couldn't, the world said you can't be both, you know? Um, and, you know, and, and sh Lucky is the person that finds out that Dr. Jolly is an artist, right? So. So, so I, I do, I feel very strongly, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share about that, that um, beauty as it's currently defined is far too limiting and that exists because we are or not and we, we, we wrestle with integration. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree and I, I do um, also, I've also experienced the, you know, people trying to compartmentalize my life and determine what I'm going to be and who should I, who should I treat them? Am I a coach? Am I a psychotherapist? I am both. And I'm more than that. Uh, and I, I, I agree with you also because um, the more we can help people to integrate those parts of them, the more it helps their self-image. You know, we don't have to be one thing. We can be, you know, we are kale kaleidoscope of, of, of things, you know. So I thank you for sharing that. I want to go back to Dr. Jolly because I know 
in your work, and you mentioned earlier on that um, other patients, cancer patients, for instance, um, have supports, and some of the, the supports that they use in their treatment or recovery are billable through insurance. Um, but the types of things that you're talking about with Kali, the type of work that you did, um, the purchase of wigs and the makeup, um, those things right now are not billable for um, uh, lupus patients. So um, can you tell me what is it that you've tried, if any, uh, anything, to um, get some attention drawn to this fact, uh, to draw the insurance uh, you know, businesses in, insurance companies, uh, legislation to help uh, raise awareness about this? Uh, can you share with us briefly some of the things that you've done? And then um, I'd like the audience to be thinking about what you can do to help bring awareness to this, because we all have influences, influencers in our circles, and uh, we should leverage them as well. So, Dr. Jolly. All right, thank you so much, Cheryl, for giving me that opportunity. I want to add to Kali, uh, what Kali mentioned, um, that um, you know, beauty is different in different parts of the world. You also mentioned that, and everyone values beauty differently. Mm -hmm. But if you're healthy, and you know whatever is happening the, on the inside of you actually enhances or um, or um, you know makes your beauty be affected. If you've had a good night's sleep, mm -hmm. uh, if you're feeling calm, you're yeah. not feeling tired. Uh, or you're happy, it shows as a twinkle in your eyes. Uh, it shows as a serenity, calmness on your face. Um, people say people who are pregnant have this beautiful look on their face. Um, so whatever happening on the inside reflects outside. If you are tired, you're in pain, feeling bad, it will also reflect on the outside. So addressing what is on the inside has a direct connection with how you appear on the outside, whatever you may value but that has a direct connection there. Mm -hmm. So resources that I think that are required by our patients, our patients spend a lot of money on finding the right makeup to put on their face. Uh, I'm not a proponent of that people need to wear makeup, but if they need to for or want to for certain situations, they should be able to afford what is safe and right for their, um, you know, for their health in the context. Same with uh, wigs. None of these are cheap products. None of these are cheap products, but um, some cultures have a lot more emphasis on hair and nails than some others. Um, and, you know, we need to be able to have people feel good about themselves, especially because if loss of these are from the disease itself. What have I done? I've been educating um, starting educating from myself. I have all these books that I bought um, on makeup. I've been practicing things on myself so I can tell patients how to do it too, um, day to day. And, um, you know, I spread the word about by publishing my research, educating other people that come under me, whether it is medical students, residents, fellows, junior faculty. I try to do a lot of advocating and, uh, you know, in the community, nationally, internationally on these topics. Um, I try on my side, I'm not a great social media person, but I have reached out to, I was talking to Kali about this a few days ago. I've tried to reach out to people like uh, Selena Gomez, um, you see, that is the typical face of lupus, right? Young woman, woman of color, right? Mm -hmm. um, she has access to resources, uh, good for her, but what she has utilized for her own um, uh, management in terms of makeup skills uh, is exactly the sort of things we were teaching to our patients, but they just don't have uh, those skill sets or the resources to do that. I've reached out to several celebrities because this is a disease of women and uh, ethnic minority, women of color. I want people there who can discuss this and make other people aware of these issues to facilitate and gain 
me, me, all of us some traction, whether it is in getting to the right ears, bringing it in front of the right eyes that can facilitate changes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a public policy person that I know how to take it to a legislation, but I have brought these issues in front of the legislative members here in Illinois with other two uh, lupus doctors. I've written to, I've written to Nick, uh, what was the last name? Yeah. I was Cannon, Nick Cannon. Oh, no. uh, I've written to Oprah Winfrey. I've written to um, who was this? That America's uh, best model uh, lady, oh, Tyra okay. Banks. And, mm -hmm. But I don't get a reply back, okay, from anyone. But I don't know how to find people. But they are like the ethnic minority group who have a big social, you know, platform where mm -hmm. they can be the person to bring awareness to this not only of patients where they would pay attention to this but also of people who can be influencers and making changes um, or you know philanthropic money to support research for the research or development of resources mm -hmm. these are somebody needs to help us move further you know, I participate in my own ways, uh, for example, with Katie uh, on this movie, including my patients. Uh, some of these patients were part of my study. Um, and, um, you know, wherever I can facilitate any education awareness uh, among the doctors, among patients in the community, I try to do that. But we need a platform of a highly visible person um, who has um, you know, who's passionate about mm -hmm. women, about women of ethnic minority, especially, then that can make our, our work go further as well as support the lupus patients. I do want to make a mention here, Laura Cooperman suggested that if more men got lupus, there should be more attention on this. I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. But also think they say, you know, women are having children, women are educating their kids, um, you know, taking care of parents. This woman is who we need to empower. It will reach more number of people by emp empowering one woman. I'm not saying don't do things for men, uh, of course, do for yeah. everyone. But I think the outreach is much more. Mm -hmm. um, we need to do this. It's high time. Yes, I certainly agree with you. And you have, we have, I don't know how many are online, but certainly, I think about 35. Uh, so for each one of you, if you can commit to sharing this with someone else, think about the influencers in your life. Where do you work, the churches you go to, the synagogues, the, the mosque, wherever you go. Uh, and if you, of course, if you know any celebrities, uh, let them know that this is, that there is a great need. And uh, women are suffering because they don't have the types of support that they need in this particular ar arena. Um, speak to your legislators. Some of you might want to run on a platform <laughs> such as this uh, because you, 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 um, there are people wanting that, that, that want to hear your, um, your voice as well. So um, Dr. Uh, Jolly and Patrice, uh, uh, Kali Patrice, you've done a wonderful job. I think you've done a wonderful service. I have really been honored to uh, moderate this, this panel. I want to open it just for a few minutes for some questions if you might have. Uh, any one of you uh, listening, if you just want to um, share any of your thoughts or any questions that you might have, we'd be glad to uh, address them. And, and while, while folks are teeing up questions, I wanted to just share this one other thing. I agree 100% with what Dr. Jolly was saying about how do we create change and how do we have impact. And one of them is, is with um, businesses. Business and politics works hands in hand. So you know, nothing changes until policy gets involved and, and business gets involved. And so for more as more businesses make it their business to be about wellness. So like my, you know, college colleague and um, Erica Banuelos and a couple of her friends are, um, and co-founders for Wellness Bridge are on the line where the inner business is about creating the bridge between, you know, making wellness part of a conversation that has to do with your business and your life. As that becomes, as more of, as those organizations take charge and actually um, raise banners and become advocates and more of those businesses are created, 
that creates change because um, at the end of the day, what our public policy is designed to do is protect us as individuals and to protect our economy and to protect our businesses. So those, those, are, those are important ways that can really, really, really make a difference. And then the last thing is media. So movies, we're here because there's a movie called Head to Head, a documentary that people get to go see and they can keep seeing it, they can keep sharing it, and they can... I, was, I, I have been exposed recently to the power of movies and media. So share with folks the need for, and people you never really know who knows someone, the need for there to be financing for a film that's about the topics related to lupus or about hair loss or about you know, self-image. That, that makes a difference. That changes people's minds and it really shifts narrative. Right, uh, so some of the other places I've gotten to is also some of the cosmetic companies. Uh, I've even reached out to um, Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I do think other companies need to partner, for example, with the American Cancer Society, all of these foundations, um, not the cosmetic foundation, but all of these working foundations, cosmetology foundation and all partner to provide these resources to cancer patients. Maybe your companies or you know someone, you know, be that leader to suggest that partner with people for other diseases. Yeah, and share and share that information. Like we are as a collective, we're where it's at. So share in the chat. You know, he, here's a way to be in contact with me, or here's somebody that might be useful. Because I agree 100%. Particularly as women, we have so much more influence. We just don't often feel empowered and recognize it. And so, you know, we've got 37 people. Um, you know, here, able to, listening, able to share and share information and share resources. Exactly, exactly. So what are you willing to commit to after having attended this real important panel discussion? Uh, do we, you know, we go to um, conferences, uh, we go to events like this, and we feel good about what we hear, we are informed, but the question is, what do we do with the information that we get? You know, how can you be ambassadors for this cause? Um, I was speaking with a cousin of mine uh, recently who has a uh, lupus. And um, she did not, it, it, it really varies with, the, the response really varies according to the woman and how she feels about herself even coming into this. Uh, my cousin is a very strong person, so, um, she didn't have the issue with the hair loss as much but when her hair started to thin she said oh it's just hair it will grow back so she cut it off she didn't mind cutting it off but then an interesting thing happened um she went out one day one of her neighbors a man saw her with the short cut hair and this goes to the issue that we're talking about uh, societal expectations, the, the uh, standards of beauty. And he says, why did you cut your hair? Did your husband give you permission to cut your hair? <laughs> Does he mind you looking like a boy? And she is very quick on her feet. And, you know, she said, it's my hair. My husband has nothing to do with this, you know. So that's the way she handles that. But she did have a lot of issues with the weight gain and with facial hairs which is another one of the things that um, uh, these women um, experience uh, so everyone experiences it differently and this is why um, Kali was talking about and so certainly Dr. Jolly was talking about needing to be sensitive to the specific uh, person and knowing what their needs are um, so I hope that this has brought you some new information that you did not know before or certainly reinforced something that you've heard and was able to broaden your, um, your knowledge a little bit. So uh, I'm going to ask again for the last time before we close, uh, if there are any questions or any other comments from Dr. Jolly or uh, Kali, um, you're invited to do so at this time. I see one in the chat from Alita. Hi, Alita. It asks about what about partnerships with pharma? Um, since they have deep pockets and make drugs for lupus. 
You know, this is a really great question. I'm sure Dr. Jolly will speak to it too, and I you probably could as well, Dr. Cheryl. But that the need is to help pharmaceutical companies see that they don't lose money from from allowing it, like finding a way to collaborate because. The scarcity mentality is anything that seems like it creates an alternative to pharmaceutical drugs isn't even given the light of day. So for instance, this study that we're talking about, that Dr. Jolly did, have you ever heard about it? We finished that study and it was published in 2018. Mm. Am I right? 2018, am I right, Dr. Jolly? Older than that, 2016. I mean, was there was there a press release? Was there you know news blasts? The things, so I think you're absolutely right. That's where that would be fantastic to have um, a leader within pharma say we are now collaborating with X and such, you know, organization or organizations to provide integrated solutions. But the key is, um, is the right mind and the right leadership that sees that that creates more business for pharma and not less. Exactly. Right. So GSK has done some events across the country and I have participated in some here in partnership with uh, Sephora um, and another uh, company. But these are what 20 patients attended, you know, even if there are five such, okay, 100 patients would have benefited in a year. We want something much bigger, much bigger that is available to each and every person and not based on who was able to get their name registered first. The movies, the movies matter. I mean, this vegan movement that we have is because there were movies like What the Health and mm -hmm. Conspiracy and, uh, you know, Super Size Me. And, and so, you know, the media, the media really does make a huge difference in terms of shedding light and raising awareness. So if you see head to head and you share it with somebody, it'll keep moving and it'll start changing minds. That's what I was just gonna suggest that if everyone here attending this panel could view the movie and share it with their friends. Uh, that's a way of getting the, the word out. But I want to thank each and every one of you so much for attending. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Jolly. Thank you, uh, Kali. And it's been my pleasure to um, moderate this. And I hope that there could be a follow up because uh, there is a need to continue with this work. Mm -hmm. And if you need me in any way, I'll be happy to help. My, my thanks also to uh, Katie and Josie yeah. and, and the Chicago Public Library. It's really been a pleasure and um, you've done a great job. Thank it's you. been very eye opening for us also. I want to thank all the panelists and the attendees. You brought things to the forefront that frankly, it's not that we ignored them. It's because we never had lupus or anything that it never even occurred to us. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. And I will at the film.